to have Swami Madhavananda, the general secretary of the Ramakrishna Order of Monks and Ramakrishna Mission, in our midst. It is a red letter day for the Vedanta movement in America. It is for the first time that a general secretary of our order has come into this country. I am sure this event will go down to the history of Vedanta movement in the West. Swami Madhavananda, after a brilliant career in his college days, he joined the order, I believe, in 1910. Afterwards, he became the president of our Himalayan monastery at Mayavati, and then he came to this country as spiritual leader of our Vedanta center in San Francisco. After two years of stay here, he went to India, and now he is the general secretary. He is a brilliant scholar. He has translated many Sanskrit books. Some of them have not been tried before him. These are important things, but more important is the fact that he commends universal love and respect from the monks. We are almost, we are about 500 in number and innumerable lay devotees. I had the supreme privilege to come under his, come into his close contact in the very early period of my monastic life. I was sent to the Himalayan monastery at Mayavati, where he was the president. And I have been very much benefited that at that period I was in touch with him. Even in our discussions amongst ourselves in India, I would say, though he did not know, that it is an education to live with him. It is a great benefit to be under, to be in his contact. One thing I remember, innumerable were the days when I would go for walks with him because that was the time when I could find him free. He was so busy. And there, are, there would be so many discussions and so many inspiring talks. I remember those things. If I am to go to India, I be longing to be in touch with monks like him. Because I have been so much benefited by him, I greatly long and wish that those of you who could, who could come into close touch with him, but that is not possible because his visit is so short. I arranged two meetings of the members so that at least they could come to some extent in touch with him. And for the congregation as a whole, I arranged this lecture. He was kind enough to comply with all my requests. The subject of his talk is such that is likely to be of great help to you. It is Vedanta in daily life. Friends, Ever since I have come to America this time, on the 10th of February, on many occasions I have been introduced to friends as well as the general public. But during the last two days, last Sunday and today, the dose of praise seems to have been a little too much even for me. You will remember that when a young man joins an or a religious order for the first time, he is very idealistic and everything he sees assumes a roseate hue in the eye of his imagination. 
so you will discount much from the tributes that Swami Pavitrananda in his goodness and brotherly love has bestowed upon me. Without taking much of your time, I will go into the subject of this evening. Vedanta in daily life is surely a very engaging subject. But some of you may ask, what is really Vedanta? Is it a new doctrine? Is it a new system of philosophy? Or has it its roots in something old? Of course, I think, I take it for granted that you know that what is popularly known as Hinduism is what we correctly call Vedanta. It was Swami Vivekananda who advocated the use of this word Vedanta instead of the more common word Hinduism. Because, as you may know, that the term Hindu applied to people living on the other side of the river Indus in India, which was called in Sanskrit Sindhu. Coming from the West, those people who lived across the Indus or Sindhu, they were called Hindus. And the Persians could not very well tackle the sound S. So instead of Sindhu, they used to call us Hindus. So from that time on, the word has come down and gradually the people themselves accepted that word. But in the course of time, not Hindus alone, but many other religionists, Mahabadans, Christians, Buddhists, Parsis and many others have been living in India. So the word Hindu is a misnomer if it is meant that all those who lived on the eastern side of the river Indus should be called Hindus. Therefore the word Vedanta is the proper word to designate that supreme and old ancient religion which has been handed down to us as Hinduism. The word Vedanta is also Sanskrit. It is compounded of two words, Veda and Anta, meaning the findings of the Vedas, the philosophical portion of the Vedas. In fact, the cream of the Vedic literature is embodied in the Vedanta philosophy. But it is not a philo philosophy only, not just a mere philosophy, it is something much more. It is real religion in the true sense of the word. It is the way of life that we can very well adopt for our everyday use so that the purpose for which we have been born on this earth may be fulfilled. Now, as you know, the Vedas are claimed not to be the work of any particular individual, but they represent a body of knowledge which is revealed from time to time in the minds of certain very pure souls called rishis in Sanskrit, that is, seers. Just as we see outside things because we are possessed of the, of the organs to perceive them, so these ancient sages of India who are very pure souls and tried to live the highest possible life in the world, well, they visualized, if I may say so, came into direct contact with certain truths which are eternal, which are immutable, which they did not create at all, of course, but which remained with God as it were, which, was, which were almost eternal, as eternal as God himself is, and those truths were revealed in the pure minds of these sages. They expressed these truths to others, gradually, those truths have been recorded and therefore we find a very fine volume of literature embodying the essentials of the Vedanta philosophy. So in one sense, the Vedanta has its roots in the, in the most ancient religious literature of the world. But in spite of its having been so ancient, it is the most remarkable thing, as you may know, that it is also of a character that can satisfy our present wants. 
though we are living in the 20th century, a very scientific age, but still the Vedanta, this ancient religion of India, has so many points to teach even the present moderners that one is astonished how those ancient rishis would come across such things. But they, if, if you ask them, they would escape any particular credit for formulating them. They will simply say, well, these are the truths as they appeared to us through the grace of the Lord. And we have simply been the conveyors, the, the uh, communicators of these great truths. So, like the Bible, having, especially the New Testament, embodying in the, in the main the words of Jesus Christ, or like the Quran, for instance, associated with Muhammad, and with other books of that nature, the Vedas has a strong difference. The Vedas are not the work of any particular persons. Accordingly, the religion, the philosophy, and the way of life promulgated in the Vedas, in the Vedanta in particular, they do not owe their origin to any particular individual. They are not bound up with the life history of any particular individual. But at the same time, it has got enough scope in it for any number of great personages. It is the most universal religion that you can conceive of. In fact, as Swami Vivekananda once put it, I belong to a religion of which Christianity is an offshoot and Buddhism a rebel child. In fact, Buddhism is nothing more than reformed Hinduism. Hinduism has got many aspects. It is meant to cater for the religious needs of the greatest number of the largest number of people. Naturally, it could not deal only with philosophy, which is generally abstruse and meant only for a handful of chosen people who are intellectually well enough, well up to understand them. Hinduism, therefore, has enough rituals in them to cater for the needs of the common man. It has also wide mythologies, which are novels, as it were, written to illustrate the great principles of the Vedanta. But all along, Buddhism is simply only one portion. Buddha denied the efficacy of some of the rituals that were prevalent up to his time. Everything degenerates in time. There is such a thing as sacrifice, sacrifice of animals in Hinduism. At one time it was kept within proper bounds probably, but in Buddha's time the slaughter of animals became very rampant and his tender hurt bred at the very thought that man should aspire after the highest religion by killing so many animals. Therefore, reformed Hinduism, and that is what we afterwards, since Buddha's days, that is what we find as Buddhism. Of course, the Buddhist, Buddhistic philosophy has been very abstruse, but what Buddha preached was the religion that was the reformed edition, as it were, of the old, old Vedantic religion, with its rituals and other things eliminated, the mythology is also changed to suit particular requirements of particular people and so on. Similarly, Christianity also, which is associated with the life of Jesus Christ. That is one section, as it were, of Hinduism. The section that deals with devotion. People who are loving in their disposition want to approach God to the means of love, to the avenue of love, will find Christianity, the most suitable organ, but that is almost a part of Hinduism. Our Vaishnavism is also the religion of love as applied to God. Only Christianity is associated with the name of Christ. Certain eternal truths were realized by Him and preached by Him with certain ceremonials and other things, but the essence of that is devotional approach to God, and that is a very important part of Hinduism, or Vedanta, as it, as it should be called. So, really, Hinduism, or Vedanta, is very wide in its scope. 
And as I said, it has infinite scope for persons. These two great personages who I have named, Buddha and Christ, they also are accepted as godmen, as very, very enlightened and supremely enlightened godmen in our Hindu scriptures also. Vedanta has made a Buddha and Avatara an incarnation. What is an incarnation? According to Vedanta, the Supreme Lord sometimes takes particular forms, for our purposes human form, to teach religion by example as well as by precept. Sometimes religion is so abstruse that we cannot follow it unless there is somebody who lives it out right before our eyes so that we can imbibe those things as from, a, from an object lesson. That has been given the name of incarnation, taking a body on the part of God in order to bless mankind. So Buddha, who preached against the Vedas, has been made an incarnation in the Hindu pantheon. He is one of the great avatars. Buddha, I mean Christ's name has not been mentioned in Sanskrit verse or anything, but those who call themselves Hindus now, at least those of them who understand things, certainly accord a very high place to Jesus Christ. And these are representations of the divinity which have not appeared only for once and finished their career, but they are, they are subsequently for the good of all, for the good of vast sections of people who choose to approach the Godhead with the help of these great incarnations. Just as there are Buddhists, so there are innumerable Christians, and so long as there are Christians, so long there will be Christians, Christ will be a force, a positive, direct force. In fact, Sri Ramakrishna actually realized the presence of Christ in a picture of the Madonna. We also have seen that picture, many others may have seen that picture, but to certain persons, supremely gifted, their eyes are so illumined that almost out of the blue skies, as it were, wonderful shapes appear. So Sri Ramakrishna actually realized Christ and thereby gave a, a, a strong emphasis from an unexpected quarter upon the truths of Christianity. But I was simply mentioning this to show that Vedanta is a very Catholic religion which is meant for the whole of humanity as it were, and it has got innumerable branches that are calculated to subserve the purposes, religious purposes of different sections of people. Having been promulgated in those ancient times, free from the settings which are the bane of the present day, the modern times, luxury and all those things, well, the present before us a very pure form of religion. Of course, as is natural, it has got three distinct types, you may say, according to the particular persons, particular uh, type of persons that approach God through Vedanta. Most of the, the majority of people in, in the world, the majority of mankind, are dualists. They consider themselves as a unit separate from other units, Accordingly to them, God has to be some, some other unit, some bigger unit, much bigger than any that we can conceive of, and we can approach that God through certain means. Because our human mind is so constituted, Vedanta has a place for that and a very supreme place. But, but there are other sections of people to whom the dualistic approach seemed full of defects, not satisfying enough and so on. So for them, Vedanta presents a slightly improved form, as it were, the qualified monistic form, just as the sun and its rays have an intimate relationship between them. Similarly, it is supposed, according to this qualified monism, that God and in the individual soul are a part and parcel of each, one and the same thing. We are, we are human beings and all beings on earth and everywhere are emanations or, or visible parts, as it were, of the same supreme principle. That is a closer approach, of course, to divinity, to the highest truth, but that is not the highest truth itself. 
So a, a small percentage of people among the Vedantis, they went still further and analyzing things and trying to probe into their own minds, they came across what is known as Advaita, the supreme unity of all existence. The supreme unity of Godhead, there are not many gods but one God, and not the, there, are, there are not many souls but only one soul intimately connected with God, rather the same God appearing as so many human forms, just as the same sun is reflected as so many little images of suns in particular ripples of water. That is the highest stage of Vedanta. But whatever the position taken is, whether it, it addresses dualists or qualified monists or monists, there are certain fundamental things that are common to all these different uh, systems. For example, the conception of the soul, according to all forms of Vedanta, is that the soul has never been created. Now this is a strong departure from the conception obtaining in many other religions. And thereby, at one stroke, Vedanta has lifted humanity to a very high pedestal, as it were. We are never been, we have never been created. We, we are the same God manifesting Himself through the vesture of our body and mind. Just as God is eternal, this human soul also is eternal. And if we take our stand on this fact, you can easily understand how much courage, how much strength, how much hope this conception will provide for us. And it is not a mere philosophical something, it is, it is realization first and expression in language afterwards. Therefore, as I say, even now in this twentieth century, this ancient religion of Vedanta has great efficacy for us. All these troubles that we now see in the world for having mistaken the true nature of ourselves as well as of others, all these troubles would be minimized if we attempt the true approach presented by Vedanta. For instance, all these conflicts between nation and nation, between race and race, between country and country, or between sections of people in the same country, upper and lower, rich and poor, and so on, men and women, labor and capital, all these conflicts will be minimized, provided we have before our minds the basic idea that between man and man there is not an essential difference. The differences that we see are only on the surface. Just as in the ocean, sometimes the waves are very big, vast billows, and sometimes they are like little ripples, but it is the same water that appears sometimes as vast and sometimes as small. Similarly, the one spirit of God permeates us, white or black, north or south, east or west, ancient or modern, rich or poor, man or woman, makes no difference. Only there are only differences in degrees, but not one of kind. That is a fundamental teaching of the Vedanta that can very well be applied to our lives. And I think this ultimate monistic approach, the fundamental unity of all existence, that is the foundation upon which the future well-being of the whole of humanity will depend. On the materialistic plane, true peace can never be established, because after all matter is limited. If you want to possess a certain area of the earth, that will be so much less from my share if I claim it. But if we try to attempt this unity in the realm of spirit, if we consider that every human being is spirit first and body afterwards, the body is just an accretion as it were, a, certain, a sort of coating, a sort of covering through which he is trying to express himself, well then the position will be entirely changed. There will be less of skirmish, there will be more of understanding because we shall be then in a position to understand what Christ meant by saying, love thy neighbor as thyself. Really, it is not a figure of speech, it is a, it is a concrete statement of, a, of an absolute fact. The same self, in Sanskrit it is called Atman, the same self is manifesting itself through every being, and in loving my neighbor, really am I not loving myself? That is the true fact. 
And if, I if we help, manage to remember that, then all these impatient acts that lead us to jump at things, to try to get rich quick, or to remove others from the path of our success and so on, which lead to skirmishes and fights and bloodshed, all these things will be obliterated. Having this central fact in mind, that we are all one in God, we are all part and parcel of one Supreme Spirit, we are bodies only secondarily, because we are in the present state, in a state of ignorance, therefore we consider ourselves as bodies and so on. But that we must always remember that we must, that we have different planes of existence. So long as we think we are bound, so long as we think we are limited to the body, we are born, we live a number of years, we pass out and so on, so long as we have that kind of idea, well, our method will be also suited to the conditions. So Vedanta says, so long as you think like that, so long as you think you are body bound, so long as you do not know your own essential unity with Godhead, so long certain laws will operate for you. And those laws we sometimes should remind ourselves of. The law of karma, for instance, work, the conservation of energy, that is what is meant by karma. That is what we work remains with us in the form of impressions and when we pass out, when we leave this body, the sum total of the impressions that we have gathered in this life go with us through our subtle body, which is the medium between the real soul and the gross body. And time after time, so long as they do not attain the highest knowledge, the knowledge of our essential unity with God, so long there will be this chain of karma going on and on, the wheel of birth and death and so on. It may appear rather formidable, that as if there were no way out of this, but that is not so. Vedanta always takes the main position that we are, after all, the supreme principle under ignorance. The same God manifesting himself in different forms, but the forms do not know that it is the same God appearing through different forms. Therefore, there should be an attempt on the part of human beings to, re to understand their true nature, to realize their true nature. The, in the old ancient days, in a nutshell, the paths pres prescribed were, remember your true nature. Just as under hypnosis, a person thinks himself to be different from what he really is, but if he can bring himself to think differently, if he can consider that he is not what the hypnotist makes him feel to be, well, there is a way out for him. So because we are now under ignorance, because we now think we are limited, we are bound, it is our first duty to remember the essential truth that though apparently we are bound, we are not really bound. So there is this karma for us, the wheel of cause and effect, birth and death and so on, but the moment we step out of this, the moment we feel our real nature, that karma will have no more binding on us. I shall illustrate it by the example of dreams. Dreams are common occurrences of which every one of us has experience. During the state of dream, how many different things present our, themselves before our mind? We may be lying in our own bed, in our own room, but we wander during the state of dream to so many different areas, so many different countries, experiencing good and evil and so on, being happy and mis or miserable by turns. During that period of dream, during the time that we are dreaming, do we ever have any idea that we are not, that we are living in a, an imaginary world that has no connection with reality? Exceedingly few of us have that idea. It is only when the dream breaks that we find what a nightmare we were passing through and then we laugh at the whole thing. Similarly, our Vedantists say that this present state of existence, this solid earth on which we are, the life that we are living in this, on this earth, all that also is comparable to the dream state. And just as the dream does not um, find, I mean, is not known as a dream till the dream breaks, so there is a higher state of man that is at the other end of, the, of existence as it were. They call it superconscious state. 
we are now living in the normal uh, conscious state. There is a subconscious state also which nowadays scientists are speaking much of. But there is another side, the other pole of the whole existence, the superconscious state, which is beyond the mind, superior to the mind. And during that superconscious state, we will understand, we will feel actually that this state, this normal state of ordinary consciousness, that has also been dreamlike. It is actual experience. It, it often has happened. Great sages experience this state of superconscious existence. Then, just as in the state of profound sleep, we do not, we have no idea of our own body, we have no idea of the outward consciousness also, but it is just a state of ignorance because we, we cannot do anything. Simply there is the knowledge later on, there is the persisting knowledge, well, on our waking we find we had, we were, we had a very sound sleep, there, nothing disturbed us, we were peaceful and so on. But that is one end of the pole, the other end is full consciousness, supreme consciousness, the superconscious state. That is the state which is the explanation of all the other states. And the rishis to whom I refer, they are the possessors of this superconscious state. In that state, they came first to fa um, face to face with the reality as it presented itself to them. And it is not only to those great rishis that these truths come or may come, to us also these truths may come. Certain necessities are there to be gone through, certain requirements, and the Vedanta has summed them up long, long ago for us. Boiled down in a few words, I may put them like this. First of all, we must understand that there is such a thing in this world as change and death. Things are not permanent in this world. They are passing and changing and changing. We must discriminate between these passing things and the, the state that we call God, or the existence, or the principle that we call God, believing that God alone is that which is beyond all change. He is above all change. He can, if we realize God, He can give us something that does not change. He can make us understand our real unity with Him. Just as God does not change, He is immutable. So by realizing His, His existence, realizing our oneness with Him, we may also be beyond change. That is discrimination between the real and unreal. In other words, God alone is real. Everything else is unreal in the sense of temporary, passing, transitory. And next qualification necessary for this practice of Vedanta is that we must also be ready to sacrifice, to renounce what we know to be unreal. If we want something, and that's if that something is hidden under the ground, covered by earth, then in order to find that hidden treasure, we have to remove the earth. So if we feel in our heart of hearts that things are transitory, and if we want something that is really permanent, everlasting life, everlasting knowledge, everlasting bliss, all these things if we want, then we must be imbued with some amount of renunciation, that is, must be ready to, to give up all those things that bind us to the opposite kind of notion. These are the two main things, and there should be, above all, the desire to free ourselves, the desire, the strong yearning for freedom, at present we are hemmed in by all sorts of conditions, but only the man who really yearns for the highest, for supreme life, supreme knowledge, supreme bliss, only he is best qualified. And having these three things, our Vedanta says that certain other uh, practices, certain other m moral virtues or disciplines should be gone through. In, uh, in, 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 so in short, those can be summed up as self-control and concentration. In other words, certain enjoyments we have in common with animals. Ours are more refined enjoyments, theirs are more crude, that is the difference. But it is the man of self-control who attains something which is not possible to animals at all. In proportion as a person practices self-control, he is above the rank of animals, he acquits himself more as a man. And along with that, that should be that faculty of ours called concentration. In every matter, even in intellectual matters, in secular matters, isn't it through concentration that truths reveal themselves to us? Great scientists who make discoveries, the big inventors, do they not concentrate upon the subject in view, obliterate, shut out all other thoughts, and pin their whole attention upon that one subject that is before their mind? And it is therefore, it is by that process that they force nature to yield its secrets to them. 
So concentration applied to our inner nature, to our real nature, of which we hear from the great sages, from the scriptures, from the great sages of all, from the great Mahapurushas, from the great saints of all religions. Well, upon that we must concentrate. So self-control and concentration should be our means of approach and having the overall picture that God is real and all else is unreal and we, we as human beings must not be satisfied with temporary things but must make it a point to have some glimpse of the reality that is God. If we have that kind of thing, if we have that yearning, then certainly success will be ours. Again and again sages have exhorted us to follow this path. Take up any religious literature of any age worth the name, you will find that in a nutshell they have been speaking almost these same things. Now, is it not practicable for us also at the present day to apply these doctrines to our everyday concerns? Most of us are living in the world, most of us are family people, we have got our own near and dear ones, we have our responsibilities and duties towards them. Can we not improve the relations by having the overall picture of oneness of the uh, whole universe and divinity of man? Of course, there, there is bound to be an improvement in our attitude. Instead of impatience, there will be more and more patience. Instead of twittering our energies upon trying to have things all for ourselves, we shall be more ready to share our things with others, because after all they are not strangers to us. Just as parents want to share their good things with the children, first the children, then they themselves. Similarly, with all the relations that we have, in, even with our neighbors, with, even with the other members of the society or the country to which we belong, if we have the true Vedantic attitude, we shall be ready to share the best things that we possess. What will happen by following this process is that our minds will become more and more purified. And the Vedantic central idea is that all power, all knowledge, all bliss is in the Self. Because our minds are impure, because our energies are being frittered away in vain pursuits of the senses and so on, we do not actually see the real thing. We are looking outwards instead of looking inwards. That which we should do. So they exhort us to look upon our own true state of things, having known them from great people, great men and from great books, and to do every day some little discipline so that we can give effect to these great teachings. It is in this way that more and more of the veils that now cover us will be taken away. It is just a case of our supreme knowledge being veiled by ignorance. But these are the positive steps. The more we think that we are one with the whole universe, that there is really no cleavage anywhere, that all these differences are only on the surface, the more we think like that, we shall be proceeding on the correct way. Just as a little wave is very tiny, is very powerless compared with the big ocean, but if it forgets its own separateness, if it merges itself in the total, well, the total mass of the body of waters that the ocean is, it becomes one with the ocean. It is as strong as the ocean. Similarly, if every one of us remembers at least some part of our, in our everyday life, that we are also of one essence, of the same essence as the divinity, that the same Lord is working through us also, no matter how small or how puny or how limited we appear to be, that is not the whole truth, because the great sages of different great religions are speaking the same thing, and they are also showing, demonstrating by their own lives how these are possible. Well, gradually, we also shall be in the position to understand some of that. It is all really a question of hypnotism, the Vedantist says, because we have been accustomed to think in a particular way, all those thoughts have possessed us and we cannot think differently. I will tell you a story that is current among Vedantists, what they call the ghost demon. If there was a woodcutter who used to, who for his very living had to go into a deep forest and cut wood to sell as fagot. One day, somehow or other, he happened to look behind and saw 
put something shadowy and instead of trying to shift what was actually happen, happening, he thought it was a ghost. It is, is a common notion among poor people that there are ghosts and some ghost must be chasing him. As soon as that thought struck him, he felt the consequence of that because that is the way of nature. As soon as we come under a strong idea, we are affected by it for good or for evil. So that fellow began, began to get emaciated. He lost much of his appetite, but he, as a poor man he had to come every day to the forest to cut wood. So in course of time there was a good man, there was a saint who uh, met him. He said, why, what is the matter with you? Why are you so lean and thin? Then he described, well, I go to, as a poor man I have to go to the woods, but a, do, a, a ghost is chasing me. Then he, the saint asked him to describe how was it, how is it that he first came across that ghost and all that. When he, uh, the matters were explained, the saint understood that it was nothing but the shadow of that own, that person that he was seeing and he was simply killing himself by this false idea. But instead of telling him, no, no, you are, your ideas are all false, there is no such thing as ghost, you are seeing nothing, instead of saying in that way, the general practice in Vedanta philosophy is, well, we take a person, a learner, exactly where he is and give him push up. So the saint said, yes, it's quite possible, it is a wood, a deep jungle, and there is nobody else, and it's dark, so it's, it's possible that ghosts may be there. But I will tell you one thing, you don't go along that way, you take some other way. And in that way, probably gave him a name or two, some secret word or two to repeat and so on, just to create his confidence. The thing was, it was this, this shadow was in front of him. The sun was in front of him, I mean. And the shadow was falling behind and he, just looking askance, he saw the shadow and thought it was a ghost. Now when he took a different path, the shadow was no more behind him. He saw his own shadow falling and understood that it to be his own shadow. And gradually in a few days he got strength. Oh, it was my own shadow that he was feeling as the ghost. So naturally he, he was, all his uh, false fear went away and he became his normal self again. It is exactly the same thing with us also, the sages say. We are really not puny. We are reminded time and again that in spite of our disadvantages, apparent disadvantages, we must remember our innate divinity. And the more we exert, the more um, of that covering will pass away. The great, the innate purity, the innate bliss, bliss the innate life, all that will manifest itself. Just as in these lights, it is the same electricity that is appearing, that is manifesting itself in different, through different globes. But supposing these globes are different, would not the light be hampered? The manifestation of the light will certainly vary according to the thickness of the covering and so on, according to the opaqueness or transparency of the covering. Similarly, if we hold strong positive thoughts, instead of saying we are weak, we are ignorant, we are downtrodden, we are this and that, if we think, no, we are chips of divinity, temporarily under ignorance, but it is up to us to crush all those bondages, gradually more and more strength will reveal itself. That is the whole of the Vedanta philosophy in a nutshell. It, it says you are, you have hypnotized yourselves and the only process out is to dehypnotize yourself. And that we have to do steadily, sincerely and step by step without disturbing others. <coughs> the trouble with us oftentimes is that without reaching the goal of ourselves, we set about trying to correct others. But great sages always exhort us to be sincere, a, a, a person like Sri Ramakrishna for instance whom we consider to be the greatest teacher of Vedanta in modern times because of his own personal realizations of the oneness of all existence and because of his God-intoxicated life in which he lived in, in constant communion with the Godhead. God was not a mere word to him, but actual life and, and, and blood as it were, the very breath of his nostrils. And it was that that enabled him to triumph over lust and greed and all other base instincts to which we generally are subject. So it was his teaching that we, we certainly must cultivate positive thoughts. If there is a room which, is, which has been dark for a thousand years, will it help us to say, oh, the room is dark, the room is dark and so on? It will never help us to utter uh, that kind of uh, statement. Instead of that, if we bring in a match and strike the match, there will be immediately light. So instead of saying we have been ignorant, we have been miserable, we have been sinners and so on all the time, 
which are forging more chains upon us. If, like true Vedantists, we hold the opposite view, no, we are children of the Almighty. We are inheritors of the supreme bliss. God is playing hide and seek with us. He is inside us and outside us. The moment we really want Him, He will be at our service. He is ready to help us. If we take up that attitude, gradually more and more of the veils go away. But somehow or other, we are like madmen as it were in this world. We know that the efforts that we are bestowing upon ordinary things, upon sense pleasures, upon mi mi minor things, they are of really no count, but we cannot resist the temptation. Somehow or other, we are impelled. That is the tragedy of life. We hear of a madman near Calcutta many years ago. His fun was, or his passion was, to beat, uh, rather to break old rejected earthen pots that have been thrown away, to take a club and beat them into small shards. He would, early in the morning he would go out to the big club and beat those rejected pots and break them into pieces, and after some time suddenly he would be tired and said, no, no, I can't do any more. He would sit down. But after some minutes he would feel rested and again he would go on and be belaboring those uh, rejected earthen pots. Much of uh, the same kind of thing happens with us also. In spite of our knowledge, in spite of our intellectual uh, preeminence over many people, we are not in no better position because the overall picture to us is not clear. We think that spiritual is a thing that must be relegated uh, to the old age, but that old age seldom gives us any opportunity to pursue religion. Instead of that, Vedanta says, pin your whole attention upon the chief thing, then the other things will be added unto you. Remember, you are in search of God. That is what we are here for. And then that God has blessed us with human bodies, that God has blessed us with some amount of discrimination, to know between what is right and wrong, to, he has given us the, prayer, the power to pray to him and so on. These things are denied to animals. Otherwise, the common things, eating, drinking and such other things, they are common to men and animals. But it is because the Lord has already blessed us that we are possessed of some amount of reason, we can understand what is correct and incorrect and so on. We can understand what is proper and improper. And Vedanta says, while there is strength in you, while there is energy in you, you must proceed along the line of God-realization and arrange other things under that. Doing your work, <coughs> but you can convert work into also worship by cultivating the spirit of unselfishness. Work that is selfish binds, but work that is unselfish that is calculated to serve others, to help others also as much as ourselves, that takes away some of the covering, some of the bondage. And in every other respect like that, the otherliness, we are too, too busy with egoistic ideas, thinking too much of our own selves, at the most of our own family, or our immediately near and dear ones. But if we expand our vision a little, if we remember the central basic truth, that the same God is appearing through so many forms, and probably the Lord has given us some opportunities that are denied to many, many others. If we remember that fact and are always ready to lend a helping hand to others, those others who are still groveling in darkness, that very act itself becomes a sort of worship. Work, according to Vedanta, can be converted into worship by, by cultivating this attitude. And this is what is expected of all of us. That way we shall not be losers. All our acts will, will produce so much purity of mind, so much clearness of vision that our whole outlook will change. And with that changed outlook, in a short time, with a minimum expenditure of energy, we can attain much more results, and much more abiding results. That Those are the things that really we care for. Otherwise, those things that we now are running after, they last only for a short, short time and then pass away. Vedanta is a message of hope and cheer, of great courage by stressing our inner divinity, our innate divinity, it shows us on the correct, on the, on the right path. There may be weaknesses amongst, among us now, in us now, but why should we think that we are only that? Vedanta rather says, no, remember, your God will be always. Although there may be failures, there may be, there may be defects in you, but don't claim them, don't acknowledge them. Just try to triumph over them. 
Gradually a time will come when, will, when the whole dream will break and you will simply laugh at, at those things. That is the message of Vedanta in a nutshell. In every sphere, in wherever, whatever sphere you may be, it is this attitude that will help more than the amount of material possessions that we have at our command. It is not that Vedanta doesn't say, well, everybody should go to the forest, should give up taking thought for your family or your du- present duties, nothing of the kind. It says, no, do them, do attend to those duties, but do them properly. Bring in this idea of unity of existence, your own essential divinity. Believe that you are destined for greater things. You will be, mo- you are immortal. The moment you realize your uh, innate essence, essential unity with God, that very moment you will be free. But till that moment you proceed cautiously, let not every moment of your life be wasted upon vain things. Do and be and make. This, let this be your motto, Swami Vivekananda said. Be good and help others to be good. And the best way to make others good is by personal example rather than by precept. Vedanta expects all of us to realize that we are really descended from God. You hear so much of evolution. We are descended uh, from the animals and so on. But Vedanta says it is all wrong. Vedanta says we are descended from God. And only in the, in the other process, the bodies, having come down from God, there is the upward march, and only that portion scientists see and call it evolution. But before that there has been another process called involution, in which all these things were there. Otherwise, how can you get out of a machine anything that you have not put into it? How do you explain the, the birth of persons like Christ or Buddha, unless that material, that, that, that spirituality was already there in those little uh, germs and the rudiments of uh, human existence. Because they were there, therefore they are expanding under favorable circumstances. So that is the whole of, of Vedanta philosophy. We are essentially one with God, only we have forgotten our real nature. Bring in the light, as Sri Ramakrishna said, and the darkness of a thousand years will vanish. We are really the inheritors of supreme joy, supreme bliss, supreme existence. We have not to add things from outside into us, to us, to make us happy. That is a wrong way. Like the musk deer, for instance, that searches for the perfume that comes out of his own body. It searches for the perfume in different directions. It runs about here and there. But finally, tired, it it sits quietly. And then it dawns upon it, that itself, that uh, the perfume... He himself was the source of the perfume. So after all our peregrinations, all our wanderings here and there in search of this or that, we come to the understanding through the grace of God that all is within and all that is necessary for us is to manifest that. A little bit of practice of renunciation, a little bit, a little bit of love <coughs> exerted, applied, a little beyond the limits of our own little family a little bit of steady endeavor to realize the highest, to, to, to realize the ideal. And where we do not succeed, instead of decrying the ideal, let us confess our own weakness. That is what Vedanta says. It, is, it gives man tremendous power instead of trying to make an alibi of every possible thing to take the whole responsibility of oneself. It is our own karma, bad work, mistaken work, that has brought us to this path, to this pass of ignorant condition, but it is also up to us to undo those mischiefs, because man travels from truth to truth, says Vedanta, not from error to truth. At the most, you can say, man travels from lesser truth to higher truth, but never from untruth to truth. That is the essence of Vedanta. Let us remember this great saying of the sages, the universal religion for all, as it were, and try to make our lives really worth living. God cannot remain hidden from us, provided we approach Him in this attitude, if we have faith in ourselves as having innate innate relationship with Him, and if we simply ignore our disadvantages in the midst of which we are placed, if we refuse to give them the primacy, if we believe, if we sincerely believe that out of all these weaknesses we shall emerge the perfect beings that we find manifested in Buddha and Christ, well, success will be ours too. God is really 
in, in us, immanent in us. And as I said, the wave by being one with the whole ocean, it can command this whole strength of the ocean. So, no matter how the circumstances in the midst of which we are placed be deficient, be unpropitious, let us bring something from within. Let us remember our divinity, our innate divinity, and exert to our, our utmost without trying the ideal down or trying to remove others from our path of success. May the Lord help us. When I took a leave of the Swami in the year 1951, while coming to this country, I had not the remotest idea that I would find him here, see him here someday. It was simply the Lord's will that brought him here. But Lord's grace also can be repeated and is repeated. And I hope sometime future again we shall find him here. Let us conclude with our prayer. Sarve bhavantu sukhina, sarve santu niya, sarve santu niramaya, sarve bhadrani pashyatu, ma kostit dukhavag bhavet. May all be happy, may all be able to overcome the difficulties of their life. May all be able to find out what is right and conducive to that spiritual growth. May all be able to find peace and eternal bliss.